Would you take your Bible as you remain standing for the Word of God as we give honor and respect to God's Word this morning? Oh, praise God. Well, it has been awesome already. I know there's a lot of plans for this afternoon, and I know some of y'all are thinking of what's in the crock pot um, or that's going to be served to you at the restaurant, or you may or, not, may or may not be eating today. Bless your heart. But we're going to eat right now. We're going to eat the word. We're going to receive the word. God's placed a message several weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, probably, or maybe I forget the day when it happened. But um, I saw something, and, and I, I don't even remember when it was, where it was, what uh, just, just caused it to hit me. But nevertheless, it did. And I'm going to preach on scars this morning. Scars are something that we all deal with. It is, um, most likely everybody has scars. Physical, outward, inward. But the scars that change his lives is who we celebrate today. And the scars he received upon his back through the cross just for you. I invite you to turn with me to the book of John, chapter 20. I am so honored that you have come this morning, that you've given me the honor to be able to speak into your life this morning. I'm just a spokesman. It's not me that's going to change lives. It's the spirit of the living God. But as, if you will do what the scripture says, it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. God is speaking today. I want to remind you, we don't serve a dead memory, but a living Lord. What sets Christianity, the relationship with the Lord apart from every other religion, their ruler is still dead in the grave. But Jesus Christ is alive and well. What Every other religion says, what must you do? Jesus says, it's already done. And I want to share about his scars this morning. John chapter 20, after his resurrection, I won't necessarily read those scriptures this morning. We all, we know them. He's alive. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the disciples, they all saw that he was alive. And Jesus spoke to Mary in the garden. And she said, "Uh, can you tell me to take the Lord? And he said, Mary. And he said, she said, Rabbi. She said, he said, don't touch me if I've not yet ascended to the Father. And then eventually Jesus, he went to where the disciples were. They were behind locked doors because the disciples still, they hadn't got it yet. Even though they'd walked with Jesus for three years, they still hadn't got it, understood everything that Jesus had said. See, the Lord didn't need a door. He didn't need an uh, open door. The Lord just walked in. All of a sudden, he was there. Let me tell you, God can still walk through every barrier that may be in your life. He walked in, and he said, peace be with you. And his disciples that were there, minus one, Thomas was the only one that wasn't there. That's what we can see. And so after Jesus left, the disciples, when Thomas came back, they began to tell him, hey, look, we saw Jesus. And, and this is what Thomas says, verse 24. Now, Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came, John 20, 25. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, said to them, unless I see the nail, what? Marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, in other words, the scars, and put my hand in his what? Where the soldier, when he pierced his side and went up into his heart and blood and water came out, signifying that he was dead. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas now was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, he said, put your finger here, see my hands. Put your finger here, see my hands. 
reach out your hand and put it in my side. And then he said a very striking phrase. He said, stop doubting and believe. It's not that Thomas didn't love him, but there were doubts in his mind that really Jesus was alive. And, and then Thomas, after he'd seen the, the results of the nails in his hands, the, the spear print and, and indention in his side, he said, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. How many believe this morning? Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Father, I'm excited about this word, but God, I, I need your touch. God, I am so um, humbled that once again I get to talk about my Lord and to the people here that you have honored me with that I get to speak today. God, they could be anywhere else, but today they're in this house to hear the word of God. And I humble myself. God, I ask for forgiveness of every sin, everything, every stain, everything that is not right with you, O oh God, that I may speak boldly the word of truth that you have spoke. God, this word is for somebody in this house. I believe it because, God, you wouldn't have given if it was not for this day. And God, I ask that you help me to speak it and say just like you want it said in the name of Jesus. I bind and curse every hindrance, every demonic spirit that would try to stop somebody from hearing this word. Devil, you're a liar. You tried and you lost. And so, God, we praise you today for victory. And whom the Son has made free is free indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Come on, give God some praise in this house. Hallelujah. I am so, so, so glad to be here. One year ago, well, come the 10th, I think, 14th, I think it was, roughly one year ago, last Easter, I was in a hospital room, and Pastor Otis was preaching the Easter service, did a powerful, awesome job, because y'all would not have wanted me here. <laughs> I was in a bad, not a bad place, but in bad shape. I had gone through, I had uh, lung surgery on the 14th, as most of y'all know, and we didn't know if it was cancerous or if it was just something else. Come to find out, hallelujah, it was uh, histoplasmosis, which is a, a, a disease that comes through, uh, in, now this is exciting, it comes through bird droppings and bat droppings that get, you can get when dirt is stirred up in, in a couple of places, whether it be in Central America or uh, the Tennessee Valley, or there's just a few places, and so probably on a mission trip it happened, and I had this spot. They didn't know what it was, but hallelujah, it ain't what it was anymore. Come on, amen, and uh, they removed it, and so, so I was healed. I believe God just healed it, and so because of that, I've got some scars. I will not show them today. I mean, no, no, I ain't going to do that. I've got scars here and in my back where the robot was that the doctor was moving these controls. And those scars represent what God did. Those scars represent, they, they messed up uh, my swimsuit competition, but those scars, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> they, <laughs> they messed up that, but that's okay. They, uh, they, 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 they represent, I'm a healed man of God. And I'm here today, a year later. You've gotten scars. Some years ago on a hot summer day in South Florida, there was a little boy that decided to go for a swim at the old swimming hole behind his house. And in a hurry to dive into the cool water, he ran out the back door, leaving behind shoes and socks and the shirt as he went, ready to fly into the water. And so he got there and he jumped into the water and not realizing that as he swam toward the middle of the lake, there was an alligator that was swimming toward the shore. 
And his mother was in the house looking out the window and saw the two as they got closer and closer together. And in utter fear, she ran to the water, yelling at the top of her voice to her son as loudly as she could. And hearing the voice of his mom, the little boy became alarmed and he made a U-turn to swim to his mother, but it was too late because just as he reached her, the alligator reached him as well. And from the dock, the mother grabbed her little boy by the arms just as the alligator grabbed his legs. And that began an incredible tug of war between mom and gator. And the alligator was much stronger than the mother, but the mother was much too passionate to let go. A farmer happened to drive by and and heard the screams and he raced from his truck, took aim, and he shot the alligator when he got there. And very remarkably, after weeks and weeks in the hospital, the little boy survived. His legs were extremely scarred by the vicious attack of that alligator, that animal. And on his arms were deep scratches where his mother's fingernails dug into his flesh in her effort to hang on to the son that she loved. And so there was a newspaper article written, and this reporter who interviewed the little boy after the trauma, he asked if he would show him his scars. And so the boy lifted up his pants leg. And and while looking at his legs, the reporter noticed that, son, you got scars on your arms as well. He said, yeah, I've got those scars because I have them. I have them because my mama wouldn't let go. We serve a Lord and Savior who wouldn't let go. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We've all got scars of sins of in our lives, but those scars also represent healing because Jesus wouldn't let go. He went all the way to the cross to die for our sins. He wouldn't let go of us. He's not willing that anybody should perish, that everyone should come to repentance. Let me tell you, Easter is all about that he wouldn't let go. He wouldn't let go of the pain that we were in. And he reached out to us that says, come all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He wouldn't let go of the stain of sin in us. He said, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. But he said, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sir, ma'am, God's not going to let go of you. He loves you too much. And he's a much wiser God than we are wise humans. And he knows what he's saying when he tells us, stay away from that, get out of that, come out from among him. He's a wise God and he'll do whatever he takes to pull you out of the jaws of the grip of the demonic. Jesus rescued us from the grips of sin and Satan when he died on the cross and was resurrected on the third day. Let me submit to you, number one, we all have scars. Everyone in this room has scars. Now, we're not going to say, hey, my scars are bigger than your scars. Hey, you, you don't know scars until you've gone through what I've gone through. We're not going to get there. We just all have scars. Some are seen and some are not seen. There's physical external or internal and sometimes scar tissue inside of us can also be a negative thing and it'll affect some areas that doctors have to go back in and remove scar tissue because it did not heal properly maybe on the inside all of us have scars somewhere on our body which have accumulated over the years and more often than not I got them here and I got them here and I got them other places we've all got them But see, these scars are reminders of one experience or the other. Some of these scars, they serve as unpleasant memories. Some persons argue that for them, each scar is a badge of honor. Then other scars people have may serve as a a painful reminder of what they went through. Some of our scars, how many as a kid, you got scars, you fell down, went down, hit, Whatever, you climbing trees, you're going through thorn bushes, you're stepping on nails. You might know what I'm talking about, you know. I played hard as I, when I was a kid. 
Some of our scars we have since childhood, a scar left from having fallen from a tree or a a skateboard or a fight or a scar left after being accidentally burned or, or after a motor accident or some type of surgery. We've all got scars. They're proof of accumulated experiences, and and apart from plastic surgery, most of those scars, physically speaking, remain with us the rest of our lives. Sometimes they may get stretched out because other things get, never mind. But we also have emotional scars that have come through words somebody has said. Trauma, abuse, death, relationships, people, sin, bitterness. Y'all getting quiet now? Anger, failures, and just simply life. These scars are the most difficult to deal with. They're internal scars. Sometimes we don't talk about them because they're too, they're, they're too hurtful. You say, well, I don't want to talk, I don't talk about it. I, 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 maybe people that have come back from a very emotional uh, and have, what is it, PTSD, I think is what they call it, from war or whatever, they don't talk about, or maybe they've come through some trauma and they can't, they can't express what really has happened inside. But I want to submit to you this morning, every scar can be healed. Because Jesus took the scars for us. I love the scripture in Luke 4, 18 and following. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives, captives bound by the scars of their past will be released, that the blind will see and that the oppressed will be set free. And I like this verse 19. It says, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. I want to just tell you God's favor is in this place this morning. On this Easter Sunday, April 1st, 2018, it's not April Fool's Day by Satan. Oh, you just think, and he's fooling you. Let me tell you, it's the real deal. Jesus died and rose again. We all have scars, but secondly, scars also witness about something. So let me just take a poll real quickly. How many's got some scars? Lift your hand, come on. Turn around. You're not by yourself, are you? We've got them. So scars can, can be illustrative of different things, but I've got to tell you, yeah, they can illustrate where you've been. They can illustrate what you've done and then that you missed that step and, and you went down and, and the law of gravity became real at that moment <laughs> for you. Whatever your scars physically came from or whatever your scars emotionally came from. We all have them. But scars, I want to submit to you this morning, secondly, scars witness we have survived and we're still pressing on. See, these scars I've got, they represent you heal, boy. <laughs> They're there and I'm going to have them the rest of my life most likely. You know, I, I, uh, I've had you know, skin cancer removed and, and they've pulled skin flap over here and then I had one thing removed right here and they said, yeah, it's going to leave a mark. Guess what? It did. I got an indention right there. But the uh, dermatologist said and the people said, well, if you'll just uh, mix in this, this stuff that's really expensive, you got to buy the stuff, the expenses so you can still look pretty. And uh, if you'll mix that together with, with uh, uh, what they call that uh, um, petroleum jelly, that's it. And just keep putting it on there. Well, you can keep putting it on there, but I still got that right there. It ain't moving away. The world will tell you how to get stuff out. How, well, you'll look better if you do this, or uh, you comb your hair a particular way. But there's always a remainder of, of the past that we keep remind, are reminded of that. But Jesus said, I know how to deal with scars. I got to tell you, your scars tell the world. They may still bother you. They may still hurt. And you may still think about some things. But the scars that you've developed are a reminder, hey, you've survived. You're still here. You may not always feel like getting up, but you got up. 
You may not always feel like testifying, but you got a testimony inside. You may not always feel your best because you're reminded and Satan brings it up, but your scars, somebody wave your hand. Come on, know what I'm talking about? Your scars remind you, devil, you didn't stop me back then. It says here, it may be there, but here God has removed every stain and every scar. I've survived. I will survive. I ain't going to sing it. And we're still pressing on. And Paul said, no, I've not arrived yet. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to the things that are ahead. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9. He said, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. In other words, we're going to get hit, but we're not going to stay down. In other words, we're going to go through some tough moments, the pits of hell on earth, but come hell to high water, I'm still moving on. No matter. You're not a failure because you stop, uh, that you fail. You're a failure if you don't get back up. Come on, shake yourself off. If you was here a couple of weeks ago, come on, shake the dirt from your feet and say, Lord, I'm moving on. Paul even said in Galatians 16, he he testified, I got scars. He said, I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. See, your scars can dictate to the world and tell the world, hey, I've got some scars. They tell me I belong to Jesus because I couldn't have got through this if Jesus hadn't have been with me. I couldn't have gone through this if Jesus hadn't been with me. I couldn't have developed this if Jesus hadn't been with me. I couldn't have survived if Jesus hadn't been with me. <laughs> wow. Paul said it this way. Now, this is where rubber beats the road. This is where reality comes in, how we deal with those things. How do you deal when you get hit? How do you deal when people lay you out? How do you deal with when, when, when job situation gets to no job situation? How do you deal with it when you have more month than you have money? Oh, that's real, isn't it? How do you deal with it when, when you only got a little bit to feed you? How do you deal with that? I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. How do you deal with it when you don't know what to do? Paul said, in the midst of all this stuff, he said, none of these things move me. He said, I don't count my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry for which I, I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. But unfortunately, not everybody chooses to be healed and they're really not surviving. There's some of you here, you still got the scars. You're alive, but you're still being reminded day after day after day how somebody hurt you or how you failed and all the other things involved. They continue to rehearse the hurts of the past. I love to hear and read some of the things that Tony, Dr. Tony Evans, pastor in Texas, he writes and he he wrote about two monks, two monks walking on their life's journey and they were traveling from one village to another village when the two monks came upon an old elderly woman just sitting there crying. And so one of the monks, he asked, why, why, why are you crying? And the answer was, it seems like she needed to travel to a city and there was a river between her and the city. There were no bridges to cross the river and the lady sat hopeless because she couldn't swim and so she couldn't get to the other side. So one of the sweet monks, he said, we will carry you across the river. And so they both, they joined hands and picked up the old lady and they they gently carried her across the river. And when they got across the river, they set uh, the lady down and she hugged them and thanked them and she went on her way. And so as these two monks, they began to travel along and the second monk started complaining just endlessly, whining. He said, look how wet I am. I am cold now. Look at the mud I have all over me. I have wrinkles in my clothes. They're dirty now. I think my back is hurting from lifting that old lady. I'm getting stiff. I'm in pain. And they traveled on down the road, and that second monk just kept on, just kept on. You better, everybody been around somebody, they just whiners. Don't point at anybody. They may be sitting, you know. And he just kept on. My back's hurt, and it started hurting when we carried that silly old woman across the river. And now my feet are hurting. My clothes are a mess. Just look at me, my feet, my back, my clothes. I don't think I can continue on this journey. 
And then he said, he looked at the other monk who wasn't saying anything. He said, what is wrong with you that you're not complaining? Doesn't, doesn't your back hurt? That monk, he said, you know, we did a good thing. My back is not hurting, but I know why your back is hurting, and I know why you're complaining so much, because you're still carrying that old lady. I set her down five miles ago. You need to let go of that old lady. Oh, come on now. Somebody got to hear this. The second monk couldn't let go of his pains and the heavy load that he carried. Every time somebody calls you, you're telling about your pains. Every time somebody gets in your, in your, in your area, you let what's out in your crawl. You begin to tell, oh, it's so and so. Oh, I just can't. I just can't. Come on. You got to let go of what's eating you from the past. If you want to survive, there's some things you've got to get rid of. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, 31 and 2, he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other. You don't know what they did. God says, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. How many want to be more than just living? You want to be a survivor in the name of Jesus. Well, I'm getting closer to the message that God has got here. Hang on. Everybody has scars. Your scars declare that you're surviving. But thirdly, I got to tell you about the cure for our scars. This is where we connect now to the Easter message. He said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. I love this scripture. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Another translation, translation says he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for our, my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him and with his stripes I am healed. Every scar on the back of Jesus Christ is declaring by testimony, I did this for you. So every scar that you're dealing with can be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. See, the deal is, guys, second or scarred hands can touch scarred lives. And that can go in a lot of ways. And primarily, I was talking about Jesus Christ. But how many understand scarred people can bring other people that are dealing with scars back into real existence. What you go through can bring a ministry of hope and healing and help to people that are going through just what you've been there and been through. In John 19, later, as we read, it says, um, well, we haven't read this one yet, so I'm going to read this. He said, verse 28 of John 19, later, knowing that all was now completed, Jesus on the cross there on that Friday, and the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. And so a jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, lifted it to the lips of the Lord. And then when he had received the drink, verse 30 says, Jesus says, it is what? Finish. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He died on the cross. His last th phrase was, it is finished. Say it with me. It is finished. It was a cry of victory, not a cry of defeat. It is saying he is really in charge. He willingly accepted death because it is the completion of God's plan. We're talking about the healing of our scars. And that's the one moment of his glory, not his enemies. It comes from a Greek word that means it stands finished. It is finished and it always will be finished. It was often used to describe the idea of being paid in full or that of perfect completion. It is finished. That phrase denotes such power that if one word commentary, it says if Jesus' hands had not been nailed down, it would have been uttered with a clenched fist raised in the air, not telling God, but telling Satan, devil, it is finished. 
It was the phrase an artist would use when he put the last strokes on his paper, a writer when he put the last period in his book. It was the statement of a businessman would make when a transaction was final. It was the pronouncement given concerning a lamb that had passed inspection. See, every other religion and every other cult bases its teaching on what one must do. But New Testament Christianity bases a belief system not on what remains to be done, but on what has already been done on the cross for us. We cannot do anything to get right with God or closer to God except to realize that it's all been done. We're striving to get something done, but God said, I've already done it. And as we continue in our walk, we continue to say, I'm coming to you, Father, and I'm expecting your blessing and I'm confident of your grace, not because of who I am or what I have done, but because of what you've done for me. Wow, every scar that I've got, it is finished because he said it. And I I want to remind you of something on this day. It's not the end of Jesus' life, but it's the completion of his task. He wasn't saying, I'm done. He said, I'm just beginning. The purpose of his hour has been completed and the consequences of his work are enduring. Max Lucado, a wonderful writer and pastor, he said, the history-long plan of redeeming man was finished. The job was finished. The song had been sung. The blood had been poured. The sacrifice had been made. And the sting of death was, was gone. It was over. It was done. And there ain't a thing one devil can do about it. Ed Young Jr., pastor of... I think it's Fellowship Church in in Texas. He wrote in a sermon, when Jesus said this three-word phrase, he was telling the world that something awesome had been accomplished. You know, to bring you in to my awesome personality, (laughs) I'm kidding. My unique, some may say weird, Some may say, you're just like your daddy. I thank you. Say that to my son. He'll say, oh, no. But to bring you into my competitive nature, I hate close ball games. I don't like overtime. I like kill them, destroy them. Beat them 60, 70 to zero. Yes. I don't like these nail biters. You know, I, I, I don't. I, now, it, it all makes for a good story and it makes you get your heart moving and you, and you, you get healthy. How I many you know you get healthy watching football games? Well, maybe that's not true. And I hate these. And I'm not going there, Jonathan. <laughs> oh, I can't do it this morning. But I hate the... I I love a game when you know who's going to win. I was watching a little bit of the basketball game, Villanova and Kansas. Villanova was killing them. You knew who was going to win the game. It was a done deal. Now, Jayhawks were trying to come back, but you knew it was a a done deal. I mean, it was, how many saw that part of that game? You know, I'm not a big, big basketball fan, but it, it was just, they were, that game, they were outmatched. And they were shooting these three-pointers. There was nothing they could do. They, I mean, they went on this terror. It, it was incredible. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a Villanova fan. I'm, y'all know who I stand with, and uh, they didn't make it that far. That's okay. Hallelujah anyhow. But I like a decisive. Here's my point. I like it when you know there ain't no hope for the other team. You say, Pastor, that's really, that, that's sad. Give the other team hope. Why? Why? Let them know they got to pack up and go home. They're losers. No, I'm sorry. I didn't. Oh, yeah, but, you know, I, it's a decisive victory. Now, that's my weirdness. I hate those close things. Let me tell you, 2,000 years ago on the cross, it wasn't even close. 
It wasn't even a thought of what the reporters are going to say the next day. Satan said he thought he had him. He thought he had him when, when Judas denied him, and, or, or excuse me, Judas paid the third, was paid 30 pieces of silver to go up and kiss him and betray him and said, he's the one. And, and Satan said, ha ha, we got him, boys. We got him now. He thought he had him when he's on the cross and his disciples stayed away and Peter in his boastfulness, yes, he cut Malchus' ear off, but later he, he denied him and stayed away from him and kind of didn't get up close to the, he was around the fire warming himself while Jesus was being crucified and nobody was there with him. Satan said, we got him now. Ah, That's what I've been waiting on. We got him now. And ultimately they denied, Peter did three times and he looked at him and then the words, the prophetic word of what was going to take place and he went out and wept. Judas ultimately gave the, through the coins but he still couldn't come to repentance and he, even, he, he, he killed himself, hung himself. Jesus in the midst when they were flogging him, when they was going through all the pain and the sorrow and that even knowing that was coming there in the garden, thinking, Lord, if this is, if it, God, if it's willing, let this cup pass through me, but not my will, but yours be done. And at the moment when he could have called back tens of thousands of angels, he was being crucified. The nails were going into his wrist, his hands. The nails were going into his feet up on the cross. The crown of thorns upon his head and the blood flowing down, putting his back up against the, the roughness of that tree, that cross. He had those open wounds on his back of 39 stripes. Let me tell you, folks, he didn't come to lose. He came to win. He was on the cross and Satan said, he, uh, he, he was getting a little bit worried. I still still think we got him. And then at the last moment when Jesus pushed up as to take a breath, it is finished. (laughs) Satan's colossal mistake was thinking. (laughs) But what he could not understand The keys of death and hell still was not in the hands of Satan. It was still in the hands of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he went, he, he, or he took them back as Satan just thought he held them, but he went and he took them back. No, he was not paying the payment to the devil. His death was a payment to the Father God that he's, that he decidedly defeated the marks, scars of sin against us. And he said, they're mine. And he took captivity captive. Mm. He died for us. I've always loved Carmen's rendition of how the death of Jesus was, and he began to count backwards. Oh, you got to see the song yet? I, 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 I won't tell you all about it. My point is, he was dead, but he was saying, don't kill me out. He had already prophesied, said, and three days later, I will rise again. Coming on that Sunday morning when the veil tore after, at his death and even dead people came back to life in the graves rattled and the earthquake took place and the veil tore when he died after he, when he said, it is finished. And it was done. It was a decisive victory. It was not 20 to 21. It wasn't even close. It was not even a thought. He was done. He was done. Satan was done. The scars were done. The old was done. The past was done. The hurts were done. The abuse was done. Everything was done when Jesus said it is finished. Musicians, come, would you? Wow. <laughs> Satan thought it was done. He's dead now. But on that third day, things begin to rumble. Things begin to happen. The devil said to his cohorts, oh, what is that? And the earth, it began to just move and take place. And Jesus arose from the dead. Romans, Paul's gospel to the Romans, he said, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall raise you from the dead. 
So you got to tell you three things. What seemed like a defeat was the re- in reality the greatest victory ever won. I got to tell you, the pain of redemption was finished when he said it is finished. He died on the cross. It was a place of torture, and he endured all of this for us. He was beaten, spit upon, mocked, nailed to a cross, stripped naked, and his beard was plucked from his face. Within this pain, there was shame. He endured the most shameful death naked on the cross that an individual could ever know. But the worst agony had to be when he felt the judgment of God and God actually turned his back on his son, Jesus. Jesus literally became the sins of the world. Your sins today, you say, I am a sinner. Jesus says, no, I am sin for you. The great I am took your ams. Your scars, your hurts, your failures, your abuse, everything Satan has thrown against you. And it's been big time. He has tried to destroy you. He's tried to, somebody on this place, you're addicted to something, but God can set you free. You've been hurting with something, but God can set you free. You've been underneath, but God can raise you up. You've been facing it and know what it was. I'm going to tell you, thank God for AA and thank God for all these other things. And thank God for these wonderful things that doctors can do. But when they get to their very end, God said, I am. I can do all things through Christ. Uh, Colossians 5, 21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For the first time ever, there was a gulf, a gap between Jesus and the Father because of sin. The pain of sin was was finished. But secondly, the plan of redemption was, was finished. He made, he reached the end of his ministry on the cross. He was finishing a work that had been in the making since the world was ever formed. It wasn't just for 33 years when Jesus was on this earth. It started in eternity past and culminated on the cross. When man sinned in the Garden of Eden, God killed an animal to cover their nakedness. Genesis 4, Abel brought a lamb to be offered. Genesis 8, Noah offered a sacrifice after the flood. Exodus 12, the children of Israel killed the Passover lamb. And we see this also on the Day of Atonement when the lambs and thousands of lambs were killed for a sacrifice to God. And on the Day of Atonement, when the lambs were killed to make atonement for the people, there was always, every year, a continual reminder of sin. But one time... There does not have to be a reminder of sin anymore. Jesus died once for us. And it was finished. The plan of redemption was finished. Somebody shout, it is finished. finished. Thirdly, stand with me. The payment of sin. And the payment of redemption was finished. It is finished meant that God the Father was satisfied with what Jesus had done on the cross and God accepted the death of his son and his shed blood is the perfect payment for atonement through the shedding of his blood. It is finished. The greatest sentence Jesus ever uttered. Had this not been uttered, had this not been done, God never would have triumphed over his foes and realized an everlasting kingdom. Nothing greater has ever been accomplished than that which was completed on the cross. He did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. And it stands finished forever because God's children, human beings, made, made of flesh and blood. The Son also became flesh and blood for only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the evil one, the devil who had the power of death. But Jesus said, I'm the living one. He's not the dead one. He's the living one. Can anybody else say that? No. He said, I'm the living one. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever. He's not just alive for right now. He's alive forever and ever. <laughs> God holds the keys to your life. A bunch of hands went up a while ago saying, I've got scars. He holds the key to your scars today. (laughs) Thomas said, Lord, i got to see your hands. i got to see. Jesus is revealing them to every one of us today. They're here for you. I got it. Life is painful. I get it. There's hurts. I get it. There's issues. I get it. There's people that's being people. I get it. There's things that people have done to us, and then times we've caused our own scars. Amen? I get it. I've been there, still there. But we hear the story. Jesus says, when you think you can't handle it, look at my hands. And be reminded that I know the pain you're going through. So God says, come boldly to the throne of our gracious God because there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most.
Let me tell you, scars are real. We all get them. Secondly, scars can tell you, be a reminder, I've survived. I'm a survivor. Some of you are cancer survivors. Some of you are, are heart survivors. You've got some really big scars down. I've been in the hospital with some of you. And those things, scars we get from surgery, it reminds us how people deal with things and we become more compassionate and loving. God says, I've gone through everything yet without sin because I'm a compassionate God for you. God is not out to hurt you. Yes, there's a real heaven. And no matter what any other leader says, there's a real hell. And it's our choice because God said it. And I believe God's word over any other man, any other religious leader, anybody else. If God said it, I believe it exactly what God says. If there's no hell, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Jesus died for us to remove sin out of our life. Say, well, thank God. I'm saying, have you asked him to save you? It doesn't just happen just because he died. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it will forever be finished. Watch this.